Out of all the gods of Warhammer 40k, none is more disgusting to newcomers than Grandfather Nurgle. But the more you read the lore, the more you understand that this chaos god is actually really complex. And that's what we're going to talk about today in another deep dive video exploring everything there is to talk about with Nurgle, or at least trying to. Let's start off with understanding why anybody would worship the god of disease and decay. If we were to take a look at the core teachings of all of the chaos gods, in other words, what their emotional embodiment is, there is only one god in my opinion worth following. Grandfather Nurgle. I want you to think about the lowest moment in your life and try to understand that for most of us, growing comfortable with this low point and the slow process of crawling ourselves out is the most liberating feeling ever, and this strange sludge through the decay of life is what Nurgle represents. Life within the Imperium of Man, or for that matter anywhere else in the unfeeling galaxy, is harsh, miserable, and full of pain and suffering. Service to an uncaring god or the eldritch and absent cosmic deities is ultimately empty and devoid of any meaning. Men live and die. And for what? For others to stand in their graves and preach the same nonsense. Where is the reward in that? However, for those who accept the boundless gifts of the Father of Plagues, everlasting hope is the ultimate reward. Decay is unavoidable. Bolters rust, the shells they fire are spent, and the fingers that pull their triggers wear down with the passing of time. Over the course of their lives, mortals sustain injuries, become infected, sicken, and succumb to their wounds, or simply succumb to age. It is impossible to escape deterioration, and yet people try. And the struggle to forestall decay moves people to action. It motivates them for greatness, it gives them hope that better times lie ahead, and that endless possibilities are available in a universe that seemingly knows only certain and crushing doom. And it is the Plague Lord who embodies this. He brings light to darkness. It is Nurgle that gives weak mortals the strength to resist the lies of the galaxy. It is the embracing Grandfather Nurgle who encourages his followers to defy the doom of mortal corruption and instead use it as a source of strength and inspiration. In the market squares of backward planets and in the dome-filled cathedrals of the chapters of the Adeptus Ministorum, preachers spew their lies upon the unsuspecting and dim-witted flock. They warn against the corruption of the soul and the filth of the spirit. They tell their listeners that to turn from their faith is to join the ranks of the lost and the damned. And yet salvation and deliverance is given to the followers of Nurgle. Nurgle's gifts are oddly harmonious, even caring. And to receive the blessings of Nurgle, all one has to do is want to live and be willing to do whatever it takes to cling to life. All else follows naturally from there. And all that is required to feel the caring touch of Nurgle is to see life for what it is and want to make the most of it. And his gifts, regardless of what form they take, open eyes even as they liquefy them. It simultaneously atrophies the leg muscles of its recipients and then gives them the strength to march towards a greater purpose. It is Nurgle's great ambition to speed this universe towards its end by eroding the foundations of reality, much as a disease can erode the spirit and bodies of those infected. Through his careful and ceaseless experimentations begun within his wondrous garden and then unleashed throughout the galaxy, the pillars that support the framework of existence are slowly but surely weakening. There will come a time when they collapse entirely and the universe will begin a massive transformation. The old ways will be swept aside like a troublesome fly, all that was will cease to be, and from the rotten ruins a new and glorious reality will emerge, one ruled over by Nurgle and his beloved and everlasting children. Those who walk with Nurgle and aid him in bringing about the great corruption, as Nurgle calls it, do so with joy in their heart. They know that Nurgle's victory is assured, and that when all things come to an end, life will begin anew. They will have helped make it so, and they will have a spot in his great kingdom. Now that we have an understanding of why somebody would want to worship the Chaos God of Disease and Decay, let's talk about one of his greatest warriors, the epitome of the power of Nurgle, the Nurgle Champion. Those warriors who dedicate themselves to Grandfather Nurgle and somehow are able to attract the attention of the Lord of Disease and Decay are some of the galaxy's toughest and most filthiest beings in existence. And to describe a worshipper of Nurgle as the filthiest, it truly means grotesque to the point of revulsion. Now we all know that each Chaos God has their own vanguard of warriors that lead their demonic legions into battle. Most of the time, these champions are former Space Marine Battle Brothers whose superhuman bodies are manipulated by the ruinous powers to create godlike soldiers capable of going toe to toe with some of the greatest demons of the warp. The champions of Nurgle, however, take their potency to a whole new level as their god turns them into the embodiment of disease and decay. 
Little more than moving sacks of rotting flesh and bacteria, these great warriors are immune to the damage that would normally kill a space marine. They proudly serve the Plague Lord Nurgle and ensure that every planet they invade feels the terror of inescapable plague and then the blessings and the embrace of Grandfather Nurgle. Relatively few of those who receive Nurgle's glorious blessings distinguish themselves as much more than a tiny but welcome maggot, doing their part to eat away at the rotting corpse that is the decaying universe. Those who do manage to stand out from the smelly and disgusting lot of Nurgle worshippers will most always receive the most mutations. These six souls will exemplify the ruling principles of Nurgle's philosophy, and thus emulate his grand and corrupted form at a level that leaves no doubt as to which of the ruinous powers has claimed their souls. These are the Plague Father's mortal champions, and it is through their foul deeds that many of the greatest accomplishments of Nurgle's plan are achieved. Every hive planet struck with a pandemic level pathogen that murders the vast majority of the population or every agri world polluted with crop killing plagues is orchestrated by one of Nurgle's great champions. So often these champions take on an appearance not unlike that of their dark patron. This is not unusual for minions of the Plague Father. Great unclean ones for example, the greatest of Nurgle's champions, are said to be small though massive in their own right versions of Nurgle himself and in turn, their excreted offspring, the Nurglings, look like miniature replicas of the great unclean ones that gave them life. Likewise, mortal champions become bloated, stinking, leaking collections of rotten flesh, exposed entrails, necrotic sores, and all manner of foulness. They are surrounded by clouds of flies, and followed by Nurglings that splash about in the slime trails that spread out behind them to mark their passing. Entire polluted ecosystems encompass the champions of Nurgle. Wherever they step foot, viruses and bacteria will flourish. Unlike the minions of the other Chaos Gods, champions of Nurgle do not hesitate to pursue enemies into the most dank, disgusting, and polluted places. There is no cesspool or sewer noxious enough to deter Nurgle's followers. Not even quarantine plague zones are off-limit to these grotesque monsters. This terrifying reality makes the champions of Nurgle some of the most resilient warriors of the entire galaxy. Marching into battle and conquering planets that most other Chaos factions would consider lost or unattainable. Once a champion of Nurgle has a scent for his foe, no amount of stink can throw him off. This determination that is part of Nurgle's lessons serves this champion well, as they do whatever needs to be done to serve their lord. Champions of Nurgle will swim through pools of flesh-melting acid, fly through clouds of lung-collapsing fumes, march over the rotting corpses of their fallen brethren, all to make sure that their Plague Lord's blessings can be shared. Lesser worshippers of Nurgle who follow these champions into the battlefield are unfazed by the grotesque conditions of these great warriors. As a matter of fact, other devoted followers draw inspiration from the morbid beauty of their rotting forms, the sickly sweet odor of their rancid flesh, and the corruptive acts they commit in the name of Grandfather Nurgle. The Plague Lord's champions all end up mimicking his appearance in some way or another. Curiously enough, some of these champions were drawn to the worship of Nurgle because they started out life bearing some passing resemblance to him. The simple fact that a child was born with some abnormality, like an exposed organ or even whooping cough, is enough to draw the kind attention of the great unclean one. However, Nurgle is more than form. He is also a philosophy. Most mortal champions and many lesser followers end up thinking like he does, though in a limited fashion due to the constraints of mortal minds. But it is the demonic champions that know their father's thoughts the best. These demon champions of Nurgle are the nearest to their god than any mortal, and more closely involved to his plans than any other demonic servant. But the beauty of the society that Nurgle cultivates is that there's little place for jealousy or scheming in the gardens of Nurgle or any of his domains. And his champions know this. Though they wish for nothing more than to be one with the Plague Father, they also know that they will never be as close to him as the great unclean ones, the greater demons of Nurgle. And as they do with so much else as a result of Nurgle's teachings, they accept their lot. This relationship to their god differs from that of the other champions. The other ruinous powers take particular pleasure in deceiving mortals, damning them by tricking them with lies and promises they will never have to keep. They see these demonic followers, even the champions, as never having a choice but to do as they are commanded. They view these champions more as slaves to darkness than co-conspirators with it. In their eyes, this makes mortal servants somehow more interesting than the demonic. 
However, Nurgle knows most of his mortal followers turn to him as a last act of desperation, but his demonic minions, most especially the Great Unclean Ones and the Champions, have a genuine affection for Grandfather Nurgle and serve him out of love. And Nurgle delights in reciprocating, reminding him as it does of some kind of cycle and therefore takes great interest and pride in the efforts of demonic champions. The desires of Nurgle and his champions are one. Each knows that the great corruption is a higher purpose that must be served, and they do so with great resolve and satisfaction. Now the champion of Nurgle and all of Nurgle's minions travel through the galaxy in what is known as Plague Fleets. Few vessels conjure as much dread as the putrefied and decaying ships in the service to the Chaos God Nurgle. Known as Plague Fleets, these massive spacefaring vessels are unlike any other ship in the galaxy. Twisted and corrupted by the powers of the warp, they are rotting away just as much as the carcasses of Grandfather Nurgle's followers. Liquefied rust running like blood across their hulls, cankered and broken power supplies, plasma coils and radiation conduits seeping their plasma like pus. Strange tentacle-like appendages sprouting out into space like living beasts. They fill up with thick clouds of revolting, fat-bodied plague flies that hatch from the walls and bulkheads. When the ship lands upon an enemy world or their crew boards their victim spacecraft, these seething fly storms come with them, spreading infection wherever they go. Such oddities and decay defines the vessels whose crews serve the Plague Lord. These vessels come from all over the galaxy, any void-traveling race unlucky enough to succumb to the temptations of Nurgle are welcome in with joyous praise as new chariots of disease and pestilence. There are, however, two very common ships encountered by the Imperium of Man, one being the fallen ships belonging to the Death Guard Traitor Legion, the other the Imperial Starships whose crew willingly turn to the worship of the Lord of Pestilence. The most dangerous of the two are the vessels belonging to the traitor space marines, and while many successor chapters in the current millennium can be tricked into the service of Nurgle, the majority of these vessels come from the bygone era of the Horus Heresy in the early 31st millennium. When the Primarch Mortarion made the decision to turn against his father, the Emperor of Mankind, the expeditionary ships of the Legion were the first to get corrupted, thus becoming the first plague ships, or poison ships as they sometimes were called. Many of these expertly crafted vessels were operated by the Adeptus Mechanicus alongside the Death Guard Legion. Most were either frigates or second-line cruisers in classification. They were outfitted to operate alone on deep-range independent missions and retrofitted to bear the deadliest cargoes, toxic, pathogenic, and viral weaponry. Their new evil tasks were to carry out dark pilgrimages across the stars, conducting raids and visitations, often covertly, on isolated colony worlds, imperial outposts, and linchpin sectors, spreading contagion, contaminating water supplies, and tainting biospheres. Although these attacks were on many worlds to slay millions, not simply by plague and poison, but by civil unrest, famine, and anarchy that would often follow in their wake, their main purpose was not wholesale annihilation. Instead, it was to create panic, to spread fear, to wound and weaken the Imperium of head of a traitorous advance rather than outright destroy, for a wounded world demanded costly aid and assistance from its allies, whereas the dead world required nothing. For this reason, Exterminatus class weaponry was rarely employed by the poison ships, but more insidious and subtle agents were instead used, many of them bred and manufactured by the Magus biologists in the War Master's faction or within the bioweapon vaults and the laboratoria of the dreaded Death Guard world killer, the Mia Donamori, which had been darkly infamous for its stockpiles of such weaponry long before the outbreak of the war. Once the nature and tactic of these poison ships became widely known by the Loyalists, they unsurprisingly became a priority target for destruction and were hunted down wherever they were encountered. The desire to purge the threat of the poison ships was so great that specific hunter-killer missions were launched against them by several separate loyalist factions and legions during the Great Scouring, and Terra itself placed a high bounty on the destruction of such vessels, trying the attention of rogue traders and even unaligned renegades and corsair forces to the task. Not all plague ships were destroyed. Many successfully fled into the Eye of Terror and furthered their descent into corruption as the God of Decay spread his gifts to these stolen Imperial battleships. It became the duty of the Sixth Plague Company of the Death Guard Trader Legion to master and garrison all of the Voidcraft that evaded the destruction during the Great Scouring. Known as the Ferrymen, these Plague Marines worked with the Dark Mechanicus to organize the Legion's rotting armadas, 
of vital resources for the now demon Primarch Mortarion. To this day, the Death Guard and many warbands in the service of the God of Decay plow through the Immaterium like wind-blown contagions, emerging into real space wherever Nurgle wills, spreading Nurgle's blessings to the wider galaxy. And then there are those plague fleets that are made up of the unlucky ship crew that fell to the temptations of chaos, whether they be colonized ships stranded in the void or corrupted navy captains who handed over the souls of their crewmen. These ships are now in the service of Nurgle, and their mission is to spread the joy of never-ending decay. Sometimes the Lord of Pestilence doesn't always have to try very hard to add a new ship to its fleet. Imperial ships are crammed, claustrophobic places at best of times, and the air which feeds their living crew is a commodity that must be endlessly recycled and filtered back into the vessel. Such lifeless air like this often becomes stale, and the stench of sweat and grime hangs heavy in the air, like a games workshop with a bunch of wargamers. Under their mask of filth, Nergo and his dedicated followers find little difficulty in spreading his diseases through the vessel. Such plagues aboard ships are not uncommon, and Nurgle laughs gleefully at such works. A ship's entire crew may weaken beneath this malady, and in such desperation, they will turn to Nurgle for protection. And so a new plague ship is born. Its crew spared the sorrow of death, but instead gifted an eternity, beset by the same plague which first laid them low. But decay doesn't merely affect the living. Nurgle beams all the more proudly to see the creations of mortals broken down by decay. The most virulent of these ills do not only strike at the flesh, but also bring with them a noxious, stinging, acidic feel to the air, which can sicken even the metal of the warship. Now that we have an understanding of the forces of the Chaos God Nurgle, let's take a look at his domain within the warp. Like a normal garden, the domain of Nurgle is home to a bewildering array of flora and fauna, all interconnected and supporting the whole. Beds of bright blue shovel petal plants dig themselves up and leave the dirt in which they grew so that plague bearers can plant new skull seeds in their rich loam. As the skull seeds grow and blossom, they attract bounding, stomping, over-exuberant beasts of Nurgle that mistake their fruits for the heads of new playthings. This scatters their matter violently into the air where it comes to rest on the wings of the ubiquitous rot flies. Slowed by the sticky pulp of the splattered plants, these insects become easy prey for other flying creatures that ingest them as they soar through the rot-choked air. Unbeknownst to the predators, blot flies are carriers of many of Nurgle's experimental diseases and other creations. With their innards thus infected, these predators sicken, vomiting the contents of their guts all across the garden as they fly about, and eventually explode in showers of life-giving flesh and blood. This bounty of mutated and mutilated tissue falls into new areas of the garden beneath, decaying into compost and starting the cycle of life and death anew. Though the Garden of Nurgle does share certain commonalities with the gardens and jungles on planets in real space, it's still not a worldly garden in any sane sense. A visitor in this bizarre and perilous realm doesn't walk from place to place, they experience what needs to be experienced. Even the demons that tend to the garden are not really what might be thought of as a workforce that arrives at a place, does a job, and leaves. These demons are a part of the experience of the Garden of Nurgle itself. This is especially troublesome for the plague bearers, whose metamorphosized minds were once mortals and still strive to impose some type of reality in this unreal existence. Still, even the plague bearers accept their place in the garden and spend their eternity enjoying all it has to offer. Just another example how the plague father affords all his children the many ways to explore and appreciate his realm, and even to become part of it. Though he is a god of chaos, he also has a need to create order, to monitor his creations, and to control his experiments. A visitor to Nurgle's realm would find a dizzying amount of diversity of experiences. Here they might find a tree made out of nothing but the flesh of Eldari, constantly oozing the tears of a dying race. There they might find fields where tongues sprout out from the earth, each one blistered by a new influence of a different infection. There is no telling what wonders await around each bend in the path that stretches and winds throughout the gardens of Nurgle, but any who encounter them will surely have their sanities tested and questioned. While the mortal realm is laid waste by blight and pestilence, the lands of Nurgle and the realm of chaos thrive on disease and corruption. Tended by the Lord of Decay, this unwholesome realm is home to every pox and affliction imaginable, and it's foe tied with a stench of rot. Twisted, rotten bout entangles with grasping vines over the moldering ground, entwining little broken fingers. Fungi, both plain and spectacular, break through the squelched mulch of the forest floor, puffing out clouds of choking spores. In this realm, the stems of half-demonic plants wave on their own accord, unstirred by the insect-choked air. 
Human-featured beetles walk along the banks of sluggish, muddy rivers. Reeds rattle, whispering the names of the poxes inflicted upon the worlds of mortals, or lamenting those that have died from the caress of their creator. There is a house of decay at the center of Nurgle's realm. Its racked and twisted structure creaks and groans under the influence of the baleful toxic winds. Shutters cling just barely to windows framed only half filled with broken panels of filth covered glass. Sewage drains spill forth beetles, maggots, and twisted centipedes with only tongues for their bodies and human fingers for legs. Paint continuously cracks and peels away from the wood beneath, yet the house never loses its gray green hue. Along the roof, hundreds of chimneys bellow out dark clouds that upon closer inspection are composed of millions of floating, buzzing flies. All around this house, trees made out of bone bear fruit that rot even as it swells. Leafless bouts of these ancient trees provide shelter for demonic birds that sing the funeral dirges of any unwelcome visitor. It is a house of pestilence, rot, and death. This is Nurgle's mansion, and that means that it is also a place of hope and renewal. There can be no explanation for the strength that keeps this structure from collapsing, except that it is a dwelling place for the Lord of all, whose boundless energy, sense of eternal purpose, and limitless joy for his work finds perfect peace with the inevitability of decay. Within his mansion of tumbling walls, Nurgle toils. Beneath mildewed and sagging beams, the great god works for eternity at a rusted cauldron, a receptacle vast enough to contain all of the oceans of the worlds. Chuckling and murmuring to himself, Nurgle labors to create contagions and pestilences, the most sublime and unfettered form of life. With every stir of Nurgle's maggot-ridded ladle, a dozen fresh diseases flourish and are scattered throughout the stars. From time to time, Nurgle reaches down with a clawed hand to scoop a portion of the ghastly mixture into his cavernous mouth, tasting the fruits of his labor. With each passing day, he comes closer to brewing his perfect disease, a spiritual plague that will spread across the eternity of the universe and see all living things gather onto his rotting embrace. Dwarfed by their mighty lord, a host of plague bearers are gathered all about Nurgle, each chant sonorously, keeping count of the diseases created, the mischievous Nurglings that have hatched, and the souls claimed by the lord of decay's putrid blessing. His hum drowns out the creaking of the rotten floor and the scraping of the ladle on the cauldron, so eternal in his monotony that to hear it is to invite madness. When not at his cauldron, Nurgle himself often sits in a massive chair just outside of the mansion's front door. From there, he entreats visitors both summoned and unexpected to approach, share tales and questionable libations, and explore the countless rooms within. Inside the vast structure, a guest could easily become lost. Rotten floorboards send many to their doom of a slow consumption by the carrion feeders that dwell in the lower levels. Grand staircases decorated with moth-eaten rugs beckon to a wandering soul, leading them to chambers where demons are glad to receive new, fresh flesh. Should the guests bypass these rooms and continue upward, they might find their way to the attic, where Nurgle keeps samples of his works of decay, cataloged and counted over and over again by attendant plague bearers. In this attic are jars containing the viscera of plague victims from across time and space. Souls are trapped within apparently simple glass containers, left to slowly dim and fade as the maladies of the spirit waste them to the bone. If the visitor walks past the stairs and pushes deeper into the mansion, they might stumble upon the kitchen and the larders of the Plague Lord's home. Every foul ingredient, every pestilent component imaginable rests on the shelves here, neatly labeled and ready to be combined in the Great Cauldron. A wise guest will move on quickly from here, knowing that to linger is to become flavoring for the noxious stew, for this cauldron is among Nurgle's prized possession and he likes to keep it full. Nurgle is a creative being and he will take inspiration for experimentations where he finds it. Seldom can he resist the temptation to add nearby visitors to his virulent concoctions. This also goes to show how Nurgle is unlike any of the other ruinous powers, including how he views his domain within the realm of chaos. Korn, for instance, rarely leaves his throne, barking orders to his generals from atop his mountain of skulls. Slanesh watches the happenings of his kingdom from within his palace of pleasure, or wanders the universe seeking to tempt mortals into giving up their souls to satisfy his hunger. Zinch seems not to care much at all of the state of his warped and fractured land, spending his time plotting and interfering with affairs in realms beyond his own. Nurgle, on the other hand, cherishes the beauty and the surprise of his garden. He routinely takes strolls down its twisted paths, speaking with his demons and stopping to observe one of the many diseases take its toll on a wounded captive. Nurgle is in touch with his land and its many regions. 
In his wandering outside of the mansion, he passes by some of his favorite places, many of which have existed since Nurgle first thought of them and are likely to be the models for the reborn universe that is to come. A moment's journey from the mansion are the deathbeds, a place he visits more often than perhaps any other. It is a place that serves two purposes. Not only are wayward travelers and defeated invaders trapped here, stored in the deep pits and sucking muck of this place, awaiting some future foul use or their eventual demise, but it is here that Nurgle can indulge in one of his greatest forms of entertainment. The Plague Lord loves to hear the stories of the realms beyond his own. They inspire him to create new pestilences that are well suited to other lands, and in the deathbeds he has countless potential storytellers. Sometimes he offers these unfortunates the chance to improve their position by spitting the worms from their mouths and sharing the tales of their worlds with him. Those who amuse him sufficiently are plucked from the muck and removed to the mansion. There they have the great honor of becoming vessels to Nurgle's newest plagues. Once they have been properly infected, Grandfather Nurgle smiles, gives them one last tender gut-churning embrace, and sends them back into the lands that the stories described. After visiting the deathbeds, Nurgle often makes the poxyards the next stop on his stroll. It is here that he tests the efficiency of his contagions of the flesh and the spirit. Each malady requires a different set of trials to gauge its ability to achieve the Plague Lord's desires. This means that the physical form of the Poxyards changes to suit the task. For the test of the spirit, this region of the garden may be filled with crystal clear lakes. A dehydrated test subject may see these lakes and believe salvation is at hand, drink deeply of the cool water, and suddenly the water will turn to pus, tormenting the sick and weakening the soul. For a test of skin-eating diseases, the poxyards may be filled with claw thruster brambles. Infected captives will be sent running into the demon plants chased by beasts of Nurgle. If the captives scream as they pass through the razor edge branches of the plant, then Nurgle knows that the poor wretches can still feel pain, and his affliction needs refinement. No matter the incarnation of the poxyards, this corner of the garden always gives Nurgle new insights, and therefore he spends a great deal of time here. In addition to the mainstay regions of the land of the Plague Lord, there are many others that enjoy a less permanent existence, coming and going with the passing of one of Nurgle's many plagues. Some of these likely only exist in the nightmare visions and untrustworthy hallucinations of disease-ravaged minds. Still, the Garden of Nurgle is near infinite, and it is not so unbelievable that a recipient of one of Nurgle's great gifts might be blessed with the fleeting glimpse of one of the Plague Lord's realms. With their last dying breath, some mortals gasp and choke out words, saying that they can hear the faint bells tolling. Perhaps they refer to the blossoms that grow in the death bell lily fields. When a mortal dies as a result of one of Nurgle's many diseases, one of these pallid flowers opens up and emits a tiny chime to mark the success of Nurgle's handiwork. The hanging gardens of Thoshbolg are a sight to be seen. This remote slice of Nurgle's realm was given over to the great unclean one Thush Bulk, as acknowledgement of his use of the choking plague to wipe out the orc infestation on Horax, a planet that Nurgle coveted. To commemorate his victory and to demonstrate constant thanks to his lord for his reward, Thush Bulg uses his own intestines to hang every single orc from the colony and the trees of his domain. There they dangle and rot, slowly dying but never quite finding release. In other places in the garden, plague bearers toss organs from the bodies of disease victims into sorting pools, making it easier for them to count the numbers that have died from each ailment. Beasts of Nurgle frolic in the fields where planted spines yield crops of dementia-inducing foodstuff. Nurglings crackle with glee as they roll down hillsides that form spontaneously when great unclean ones vomit up regimens that they consumed thousands of years ago. The land of the Plague Lord is a wondrous place filled with vitality, mirth, and the experience beyond mortal comprehension. It is a playground for the minions of the Lord of Decay, a laboratory for his works, and a conforming home for a god that knows his realm is the shape of things to come. And that's just a brief deep dive into the lore of Grandfather Nurgle. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Subscribe to the channel because I'm going to be talking about Nurgle and all of his minions in the following videos. It's going to be a lot of fun. If you enjoy this content, hit the like button, share with your friends on Facebook, Reddit, whatever social media you guys use. Comment down in the comment section below. Let me know if you want me to cover another Chaos God. And also, if you want to support the channel, hit us up with a super thanks or support us on Patreon. The link Link is in the description below. Thank you guys so much for listening, and we'll talk tomorrow. This is Gersh1 with One Mind Syndicate signing out. <laughs>
Yeah.